Before Hello. you stand up yet, what's up? We're good. Ladies and gentlemen, please join in welcoming Kent Emerson, President of the Empire Club of Canada, to the podium. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, from the Fairmont Royal York Hotel in downtown Toronto. Welcome to the Empire Club of Canada. For those of you just joining us through either our webcast or podcast, welcome to the meeting. Today we present Dan Snow and Peter Mansbridge for today's topic, History in the Modern World. A 1998 speech to the Empire Club by the then director and CEO of the Canadian War Museum entitled, quote, Who Killed Canadian History? The quote was, without a sense of our past, we are like poor souls wandering lost in a forest without a map. Without a sense of our history, we can have no future. Without a firm gr grasp of whom and where we are, we cannot hope to successfully integrate the newcomers who come to Canada to build a new and good life in this most favorite of nations. Without history, our children will know nothing of what made Parliament, our laws, our society, and the way they are. Without history and the techniques that study teaches us, the ability to read, write, and reason can never be well taught. Without history, our sons and daughters will never know what their fathers and grandfathers did to help save the world. And I think that is incredibly well said. The Empire Club of Canada has always been a believer in the importance of documenting our past. And that's why the speech I just quoted to you and all speeches from the past 114 seasons have been pre preserved and bound in what we call the Red Book. Since 1903, the Red Book has been used by university students in understanding Canadian history. It's been a part of the tapestry of our history. Thanks to all of you guys, all the audience members today for sharing this experience with us. Our collective history about the country we live in determines in many ways our view of the world and how we make decisions. The old adage that, quote, those who do not understand history are condemned to repeat it is well accepted as being an obvious truth. In that people's understanding of their personal history and that of the country is so often strongly influenced by political and in many places the religious ideology of that point in time. What makes, what makes Canada Canada? What makes all of us Canadian? It's our shared experience and our shared understanding of that experience. And that's why today the Empire Club will present one of the world's most renowned historians in conversation with one of the most successful broadcasters and communicators of past decades. Together, they will dive into how Canadians can better understand their future by having a good grasp on events and leaders who got us to where we are today. So I'm going to start with Dan Snow. Today's guest is the host of one of the world's most listened to history podcasts and founder of a new history channel, HistoryHit.tv. He regularly works with the BBC and The One Show. Born and raised in London, England, he remembers spending every weekend of his childhood being taken to castles, battlefields, country houses, and churches alongside visiting Canadian historic landmarks. Half Canadian, half English, Dan developed a great love of history while studying at Oxford and immediately starting started presenting military history programs with his father, Peter Snow, the notable BBC broadcaster. He has written or contributed to several books, including On This Day in History, Death or Victory, The Story of the Siege of Quebec in 1759, The World's Greatest 20th Century Battlefields, and most recently, The Battle of Waterloo Experience. Dan is a, Dan is a proud ambassador and champion for English heritage, a UK-based charity that uniquely cares and looks after 400 plus historic sites across England and tells the story of England and its world history as and where it happened. The Empire Club is proud to welcome historian broadcaster, television presenter and ambassador for English heritage. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Dan Snow. At the Empire Club of Canada, we've often used the turn of phrase, the speaker needs no introduction. 
This could not apply more to anyone than today's moderator, who's a household name in Canada. He's a widely respected journalist in the face of CBC News for nearly 30 years. Nonetheless, I'm incredibly honored to make this introduction. I take pleasure of this because I grew up watching our guest on his nightly spot, along with the rest of you, as the chief correspondent and lead anchor of CBC's The National. He had this role from 1988 to 2017, winning 12 Gemini Awards for broadcast excellence, including the Gordon Sinclair Award for the best overall broadcast journalist in 1990 and 1998. His other honors include two Canadian Screen Awards, numerous honorary degrees and lifetime achievement awards from Radio, Television, and Digital News Association. He has also been inducted into the Canadian News Hall of Fame and, it's, and an officer of the Order of Canada. He is deeply passionate about the importance of history and national history. To underscore this, I have found a passage in his 2002 speech to the Empire Club of Canada, uh, of Canada titled, Canada in the Future. And he said about this country, quote, we were meant to have courage and determination in spirit. We were meant to teach our children that life is good, and we were meant to teach them that they can make it better. Robert Davis Davies once said that Canada is not a country you love. It's a country you worry about. He was right. I certainly worry about it. I worry that we, we may become a timid, timid people. I worry that so many of us are unaware of the greatness of our past that we may become doomed to believe that we cannot be great in the future. And I know how sad that would be, unquote. Peter is drawn to broadcast the most historic events. He set his retirement broadcast to the coverage of Canada's 150th celebration. He has most recently worked with today's future speaker, Dan Snow, on uh, a number of things, including December's CBC program called Royal Wedding for the Ages. On his third appearance at the Empire Club of Canada, please welcome renowned television news anchor, journalist, columnist, Peter Mansbridge. Thank you, everybody. That was uh, just the way I wrote it for you, Kent. It was great. <laughs> um, I, let me say a couple of things, first of all, about our real guest here today and Dan, uh, who has brought to life history in, in, in ways that uh, I don't think any other historian has. And he's brought in a whole new audience of, uh, of young people by his dynamic presentation. And of course, he's young. <laughs> he's also really tall. <laughs> so I didn't agree to do this unless we were sitting. Um, but it's, kind of, it's an interesting mix because you've got, you know, the British historian who has deep connections to Canada. Many of you would know his mom, uh, Anne Macmillan, and his aunt, Margaret Macmillan. So we like to say he's Canadian, really, <laughs> even though he was born in Britain. Um, on the other hand, you've got me, who was born in Britain, and 65 years ago, today, I got off the boat in Quebec City as we came to Canada. Oh, how are you guys? Oh. <laughs> I didn't realize that until my sister wrote me this morning, <laughs> sent me an email this morning and told me this is the anniversary. Ca carried off the boat, ba babe in arms. Right? Yeah, I wish. Little tiny newborn, <laughs> yeah. newborn. A newborn. Yeah. Yeah, it was just struggling in my sixth year at that point. <laughs> but nevertheless, it was, uh, you know, it was a great opportunity uh, for our family, and, uh, and we uh, obviously never regretted uh, the move. Uh, for Dan, he has the best of both worlds, and uh, he gets here pretty frequently yep. to visit relatives and to talk history. Um, so I'm going to throw back a quote of his right away. History is the most exciting thing that's ever happened to anyone on this planet. <laughs> now that's before the Leaf game tonight, right? <laughs> Tell me about why it's the most exciting thing that's ever happened to anyone on it's this funny, planet. Lots of people pick out that quote to suggest that I'm insane, but that's, <laughs> it seems to me self-evident. I mean, history is everything that's ever happened to anyone who's ever lived, who breathed, who's ever walked this planet. 
And therefore, whether or not it's Alexander the Great leading the cavalry charge at the Battle of Gargamela, pushing off the right wing, swinging round and taking Darius out at the end of that battle, or whether it's the Leafs winning, now ancient history, <laughs> the last Stanley Cup. <laughs> or whether it's, you know, whether it's, oh, uh, or whether it's, you know, it's your parents' eyes meeting across the dance floor in that nightclub for the first time. You know, history is, that, that is, for me, I, I think we, we, sometimes we're not good enough at defining history. We, I mean, I think we can say that history, we, we hive off all the other bits, culture and film studies and, and engineering and medicine, and then what's left is a kind of slightly dry uh, legal, legal, legal history, if you like, of, of constitutional development and kings and queens. And I, I think we need to just be confident and firm about dragging back all that other stuff and talking about the because because human beings we are an astonishingly eccentric species and the stuff we've got up to when you when you realize when you set your boundaries from from ancient Sumeria right up to Donald Trump's America is completely remarkable yeah that's quite a span <laughs> doesn't seem to be heading in the right direction <laughs> um, you know Kent mentioned in in his remarks um, that saying that we've all grown up with, uh, that you know, unless you understand your history, unless you know your history, you run the risk of repeating the mistakes that history teaches you. Um, I like that quote for this reason. I remember uh, doing my first broadcast from Afghanistan um, when the Canadian troops were there, and I, it was 2003 or 2004, and the, we were doing it live, back here, and my first guest was uh, Rick Hillier, the Canadian general, who was at that point the commander of all coalition forces uh, in, Af in Afghanistan. And I looked at him and I said, you know, when you look around this country and you see the kind of carcasses on the ground of past armies that have tried to invade Afghanistan, and it hasn't worked out very well in most of those cases, now you're coming in here, a big coalition force. I'm sure you've read history, because that's the kind of guy General Hillier is. But why do you think that you can not repeat the same mistakes that happened in the past? And he said, oh, we know our history, and that'll never happen. We know how we're going to deal with this. Well, here we are almost 20 years later. The Afghan war is not over. And they're sitting down negotiating with the Taliban, the people who they went in there to defeat about trying to come up with a peace agreement. So you could argue that whether that phrase works in that case or not. But generally, how do you feel about, given what you know about history, what do you feel about that phrase that we use, that if you don't know your history, you run the risk of repeating it? Yeah, I think, I think it's, uh, um, it's, it's one of the most well-known phrases, and I think there's a lot of truth in it. I, I mean, I, again, coming back to my early point, which is, we know that it's the scientific principle is all about re history. You know, you, you learn, you do an experiment, doesn't work out, you build and enlarge. Failure is, is, is a, key, a key part of development in engineering and science or medicine. The first thing, when you go to the doctor, the first thing that happens is you, you talk about your history, you talk about what, you're, what the events that have led you to the place you are at the moment. So, um, yeah, I mean, clearly I, f I find any, any study of statecraft History is vital, right? I mean, if you're going to try and sort out, I mean, look at the world at the moment. If you're going to try and go to the Israel-Palestine, Northern Ireland, uh, Sudan, Mali, Timbuktu and Mali, you, you, any, any way, any solution, any way of coping with these, with these problems in these countries, that doesn't just start with working out what, where that history has come from, the composition. How did, these, how did Mali, what is Mali and where did it, where did it come from? Uh, that the unique geography of Mali, bolted together by the French, a Tuareg, largely Islamic northern, uh, northern half of that country with Timbuktu in it, and then, and then a Bantu African, uh, largely Christian or animist south, these two bits put together for imperial convenience by the French. And so, so does any discussion around Mali, that blighted country, which I happened to, happen to visit the other day, needs to start with history. 
any discussion, Trump and the government. I mean, what's interesting about Trump, oh, we mustn't just endlessly talk about your southern neighbor. It's so difficult not to because he looms so large. But, you know, when Trump... You He's think, your friend. You just invited him for another statement. Right. He's minute. coming to the palace. <laughs> <laughs> He's coming to the palace. That's right. I'd like to say it was unusual to invite, but I mean, the poor old queen's had a lot of, a lot of uh, dodgy folk at the palace over the years. But, uh, <laughs> but you know... The, the, what's interesting about him, he doesn't, he doesn't, doesn't seem like he's aware of the complexities of the Golan Heights, for example, the, the, the complexity of what's going on in Israel Palestine, or indeed uh, in, in Korea. So that's why I, I think he's ultimately frustrated, and Mike Pompeo is ultimately frustrated often in their attempt to fix problems in the world because they don't have a strong enough grasp of, of the underlying of, of what's causing those problems. And of course, we got Brexit close to him. I don't want to be the smug Brit who's always laughing at North Americans. I mean, you know, we, we, we're. Uh, we're leading the field at the moment when it comes to <laughs> ahistorical mistakes. But, but we're, we're, I think we're going to talk about Brexit in a bit, so I won't, I won't jump the gun. There. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, we, we better spend a few minutes on Brexit. But, uh, <laughs> but before we get there, um, another one of your quotes. Oh. Okay. You wrote a piece in the Telegraph in uh, 2017 where you said, Canada and Britain share a past. We are fellow travelers in the uncertain world of the present. What were you thinking on you? Well, I think, over that? I, you know, until 150 years ago, the place that we're sitting in now was known as British North America. This is it's fascinating. The, the, the Britain, uh, the, the, uh, just after the fall of Quebec, 1759, the end of that war, 1761, there was this brief, remarkable period of, of North American history where Britain basically controlled the entire continent uh, west of the Mississippi from, from Florida up to Hudson's Bay. And um, that didn't last long, because those ungrateful Americans, <laughs> patriots, upset the apple cart there. But anyway, uh, and, uh, and so, um, so the, the bits that were left, the bits that were left were, then the British, you know, there was, there was the United States of America, and then there was British North America. The bits, and that's why, by the way, when uh, people in the UK, as they often do, go, well, this is the great thing about Britain, standing alone in 1940 against German Wehrmacht and Luftwaffe, I just go, I, I'm sorry. I just have a quick point to make there. The second largest country on planet Earth was firmly alongside Britain. So like this giant economic, demographic, agricultural, industrial powerhouse, a big, the, the largest chunk of North America, in fact, was, uh, and people say, oh, it wasn't truly a world war until, and like, hold on, the, the largest bit of North America was involved in the Second World War from September 1939. And it's, so, so, I think the Atlantic is just as the channel, just as the English Channel has been a, an air gap for many people in the UK, seeing, seeing Europe ending in one place and, and Britain starting in another, even though we're a 20 mile gap between Calais and Dover. I think um, the Atlantic Ocean has acted as a kind of air gap between, for British understanding and, and sort of remembering Canada. I mean, 19th century historians talk about Canada being Britain's Wild West. So the, Canadian, the, the Americans had their, their Western expansion. Britain also had its Western expansion, but there was an Atlantic Ocean in the middle. Uh, and it was an Atlantic Ocean dominated by, by British ships and, and increasingly telegraph cables and things. And, and politicians in the early 20th century, when, when there was this thought about how the, the, the world was full of empires and some were transitioning to nation states, and British politicians complained endlessly about why the Americans were allowed to conquer a whole bunch of territory and call it America. The Russians had conquered a whole bunch of territory and called it Russia. And Britain's own expansion was going along through British North America into Canada out west. But because there was an ocean in the middle, so it looked completely illegitimate. You know, it was, and they called it the tyranny of salt water. They said, well, it's, you know, the only difference is we have to get on a boat in Bristol and we get off in Halifax. But apart from that, show me the difference. The, the Russians are uh, dispossessing the Chinese, removing native people from land west of the, of, of, uh, east of the uh, Urals. The Americans are on this giant imperial project in the south and west of that continent and into the Pacific. So how come Britain's the bad guy? What's going on around here? But Britain was unable to make that transition into... And lots of people were suggesting, you know, wouldn't it be great Britain that the Commonwealth could have an imperial parliament, but I think in the end, the geography just kind of undid it. And also, you see that Britain, the great British invention, its gift to the world, the railway, kind of undid Britain in the end, because the railway forged an empire in America, in Germany, in, uh, in Russia, in India, and in Canada. And it meant, because you couldn't get on a train and hop somewhere, it suddenly, it, it just had the effect on the kind of building of nation states. It kind of went differently. So. 
Um, I think that the, the Canadian story is, of course, partly, it's many, there's the story of the indigenous peoples, of course, as well, and, but it's partly the story of British. And if you look at the people we're talking about, we, we are sitting in the, you know, th this building is named after one of George III's slightly errant sons, um, as was this city, you know, Fort York. Uh, we are, I was, I was on looking at the map today, you've got Simcoe born in Britain, you've got, you got McDonald, who I was looking at the, the, the westward expansion, uh, apparently now um, controversial, certainly on the west coast, with some statues being pulled down and things. So uh, these, these are British-born people. This is a, this is a, this, the Canadians are British. Were, and, and then we've got the First World War and the Second World War. So we got um, 100 years ago last year, the Canadians played a disproportionately large role in the defeat of Germany on the Western Front. The Canadian Corps were the crack troops of the Allied force by 1917, 1918. The Battle of Amiens, the Canadian Corps advanced the furthest any Allied unit had advanced in the whole of the Second World, First World War on the Western Front. As a fact, I enjoy telling Brits uh, as often as possible. Um, and uh, what do they say when you tell them? Well, they, well, they, they just they just go, huh? <laughs> <laughs> you know, they just it's just a, it's it's but we've because the, because we are we have gone we've we've gone our, we've gone we've taken different tracks because Canada has become a hugely self-confident, independent, proud uh, country with its own national story, its own, has drifted apart, of course, from Britain. It's no longer economically or politically or socially or culturally dependent on Britain. When I was, even when I was a kid, I, I understand that, you know, British soap operas, British TV shows were like top rating Canadian shows, right? And, and, and that was always, uh, and, uh, you know, and today British people are surprised to hear the Queen is still on Canadian banknotes and stuff. Like it's a, it's just as, as our, our, our paths have diverged, of course. But, the, but you know, the, the links are so powerful. I'm here on behalf of English Heritage for this trip. And English Heritage, you go to these English Heritage properties, um, these medieval castles. Well, the, the, the thinking that was going on, Magna Carta, the, the, the decisions that were being made in these great castles, these parliament buildings, they affected all of our ancestors. You know, the ones, whether, whether or not they were among those who took the boat west or stayed in the home country, that was the cultural and the intellectual and political milieu and linguistic milieu. We're speaking English in this room, uh, named, after, <laughs> named after the errant son of George III. So, so much of this story of us meeting today is about a, a is, is goes back beyond confederation to a time when Britain and Canada were, were almost as one. You know, the, the, the relationship has changed over time. You know, there's always been that connection, but, you know, it started off with sort of England as the parent, yeah. us as the child. Yeah, then it changed. became sort of England as the older sibling of the two. I think I know where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys are in one hell of a mess. Over That's right. There. So, so it's a bit like, is it the godfather where the younger, the younger sibling? <laughs> yeah. And then who's yeah, Fredo. Fredo, is the useless older, right? So we're Fredo and then you guys are the... <laughs> <laughs> but how would you describe the role? I mean, I find it interesting when, when you talk about trying to explain our role in the, in the First World War. Wait till they find out that we were a D-Day. I mean, oh, not just a D-Day, I mean, one, <laughs> well, and, in, and you know, there's English heritage properties across Southern England where the Canadian troops trained for D-Day and, and uh, garrisoned these wonderful castles and things. But no, the Canadians played an enormous role in D-Day. They played an enormous role, as you know, um, liberating Holland in particular, yep. and Canadians are still welcome there as, as liberators. But how would you describe the relationship now? Like, uh, where are we on that sort of scale of how the relationship has developed over time? Well, uh, you've, outgrown, you've outgrown your, you know, like your, your, your creators, right? It's the, old, it's the old Frankenstein, I'm going somewhere with AI and stuff, I'm not really gonna get there. But you've outgrown, you, you are now, this hugely powerful, you know, huge, well, one of the great world's greatest soft powers, cultural, intellectual powers, uh, hugely dynamic economy that isn't in any way dependent on Britain. You don't need, you don't need us for anything anymore. You used to need us as sort of immigrants, maybe, or, or migrants. That's not, no longer true. Uh, and so it's a story now, I think, as you say, of siblings. It's like, you know, there's my uncle in the audience uh, there, and he's, you know, I, when I was growing up, my Uncle Tom was, was, was you know, a, a god to me, right? And now I've grown up, and and he's still a god to me. But like, <laughs> but you know, we're gonna have a, we're gonna have a beer, and we're gonna watch the hockey, and we're we're buddies now, and and we give each other relationship advice or whatever it is, right? And so, <laughs> and so, and, and so, I think that's kind of the story. But but uh, and but but I think that and in particular in our and particularly as Britain lost its global empire, then like, like with Australia, like with Canada, you guys started paying more attention to the neighbourhood. 
because Britain was unable to offer you. Australia, during the halfway of the Second World War, went, Britain, it's been great. Our, our security against Japanese now depends on the US Pacific Fleet. Sorry. And Britain was like, yeah, I'm afraid mm -hmm. so. We can't afford to have a massive fleet in the Pacific and a massive fleet in Europe. Just can't do it. And the Mediterranean. So, you know, and, and, and the same kind of thing happened in Canada. You guys went, actually, we, you know, if we're, if, we're, if we're having interesting discussions in the, in the Pacific area, the Arctic, Britain doesn't really have a huge role to play. Now, ironically, it's us going to come knocking on the door now for, for trade deals and things because we're severing our links with Europe, apparently, if that happens. And I think we may, the relationship will be completely reversed. We are going to come to you as, you know, as, as supplicants. The Consul General sitting here, right? Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Um, let, let, let's, let's deal with the elephant in the room uh, being Brexit. I that's harsh on the Consul General. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the, um, the Brexit issue, I mean, I, I find it fascinating for a number of reasons, but in a way, you know, it is the flip side of what we went through almost 30 years ago, or 30 years ago with the free trade negotiations, uh, where there was a, a fear on the part of a good number of Canadians, that we were um, giving up our sovereignty mm -hmm. by working into a, a deal with, uh, with the Americans. And in the election that followed, it was, I think it was about 60-40, Bill Graham would remember, um, in terms of, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> he lost. Um, but he made a remarkable comeback a couple of years later. But the, the, the issue was those who were against Free trade outnumbered those who were for it, but you know because of our uh, um, first past the post yeah. system, they uh, uh, you know the conservatives won and free trade went into effect and it's been there uh, ever since. Um, here you have the situation that uh, that you were protecting your sovereignty. At least that's what the Leave people would yeah. say, right? So w where is this now? Because I got to tell you, for most of us, we just go you know, wake me when it's over. Yeah, well, because there have been so right. many false starts on an ending to this. Well, this is one lesson from history I think is very interesting. Is it's very unusual for people to voluntarily pull their sovereignty upwards, right? It's much more attractive. Like we all, especially as I enter middle age, you dream about an island with just me on it, sitting around, no one telling me what to do. You know, and that's why Canada is so wonderful. Because you go to Georgian Bay and you can live that dream. <laughs> uh, and and you, you rarely hear people going, you know what I want to do? I, wanna, I want to pull my sovereignty to achieve outcomes together, but I recognize that I will maybe be outvoted and have to do things I don't particularly want to do, but I'm bearing in mind it's for a greater good. So that's a, that's a harder philosophical principle, right? The USA. Uh, managed to bind those 13 you know, those colonies together, but then fought the bloodiest war in their history uh, in the 1860s to try and keep that dream alive. Because in Scotland, uh, we recently had a referendum that was remarkably close. Unbelievably, Britain, which is thought around the world to be a pretty, pretty unified nation state, a large, the, the northern half of our island, 45% of people voted to leave, right? The British, the UK project. In, in, in Canada, I need to tell you guys, two referenda in, in the 90s. The second one was like uh, the com most complicated question in the history of the world, and it was what, 0.1? It was crazy, you know, the, the percentage in, in Quebec that uh, the, the, the majority right. for remaining in Canada. So Spain, Italy, there are, there are huge pressures on modern nation states because it is a very beguiling thing, which is, guys, Let's get rid of those southern Italians and we'll be rich. You know, the people, I remember being Alberta in the 90s and with the oil sands, everyone was like, yeah, you know what, hang on. What about Quebec? What about Alberta independence? Now we're talking. So it is, a, it is an attractive concept both individually to have in, to assert individual sovereignty. I'm going to take back control. I'm going to make myself great again. I'm going to get rid of all these other people. And, and so that, we are experiencing a spasm of that in Britain at the moment, both internally because of Ireland, with Scotland, but also with our relationship with the EU. And it is, it is attractive. People are saying, we are, we are outvoted, we are doing things, that, and we are, we are not able to have as much control over these outcomes as we'd like. Now, uh, and that's a, you know, that's a reasonable point of view. I, in my opinion, that point of view underestimates the nature of the interconnected, globalized world. It also un underestimates the nature of Britain as a European country of the last 2,000 years. Um, Britain, oh, from, for much of the last 2,000 years, has been part of a trans-channel empire. We don't like to think about it because Britain's kind of snapshot of itself 
is the hot summer of 1940. Winston Churchill, White goes Dover, RAF, everything's fine. No Canadians, certainly no Poles. We don't like to think about the Polish airmen. But, uh, you know, that's a, there's a snapshot. Or, or the 1890s, Britain has the largest fleet in the world, the largest empire the world has ever seen. And it can just go, you know what, Europe, you do whatever you like, we're fine over here. But those were actually, ab those were abnormal in British history. The normal in British history is we are like, insanely integrated. Our entire British economy was basically built on supplying the low countries with wool through the medieval period, right? So our, our whole economy in the 19th century was, re, was importing stuff from the rest of the world and then pushing it into Europe, into the Danube and the Rhine. Our trade with Europe was worth much more than our trade with our empire. So we, uh, we, we, it is difficult for British people sometimes to, and, and history is a huge part of that. We, want, we see ourselves as this fiercely proud, independent, once mighty nation, and we don't understand why we have to walk into a room in Brussels with 25 other finance ministers and hammer out a compromise, that, but which brackets, ironically, we were usually on the winning side of. We had pretty good, we had pretty good outcomes in Brussels for us, but, but, the, but it was sold to the British people that we were being outvoted, we were being railroaded, and it's an attractive argument to say, let's just let's put up a barrier. And then, of course, there was the question of race as well. And the, and the Russians, we now know through dis disinformation, and the, and the nationalists on the other side, the Leave campaign, were putting up huge big posters of predominantly non-white people uh, coming over from the Middle East, uh, ref refugees from ISIS or in North Africa, uh, and, uh, and scaring people into thinking we were about to be submerged under a, a wave of non-white immigration. So there's all sorts of things going on there. All right. I'm um, going to ask for questions from the audience in a minute, but it's just two other areas I want to go to. On just a last point on, on Brexit, because it's often at times like this in a country where there's a, you know, a crisis surrounding a, a, an issue that you you tend to define yourselves. I know that Canada went through this both on free trade and on the various constitutional crises of the uh, 80s and 90s, um, that at least at the end of it, you had a better sense of kind of who you were as Canadians. And I, is there any sort of reevaluation or defining of what a Brit is today? Yeah, that's interesting. During the Scottish referendum campaign, I don't know if this is in Quebec, during the Scottish referendum campaign, the number of people in Scotland that identified as British actually crept up slightly. Uh, and I think that that's, we don't know where this crisis is going to end, but certainly it's funny because it's turned, like lots of people are like, I don't really, I didn't really think about the EU that much, to be honest, five years ago. And now my kids are in EU t-shirts. We're marching through the streets. <laughs> like, I'm like, the EU, I don't even know how it works. I'm not even sure about the statutory function of the, anyway, you know, so, but so it, I think there will be a process. Uh, and, and of course, this is what the battle for Britain's soul at the moment, because if the leavers win and, and we do see, you know, tighter immigration, harder for international students to come, harder for people to get visas, start businesses. You know, my, my other, oh, I've got a wonderful nephew here today. His brother came, studied a business school in Spain, met lots of other really bright kids. And it was the obvious decision. They want to start a tech business. They're going to come to London because that's the, that is the thing to do. Now, after Brexit, if we, if we lose, the fear that London will lose that luster, we will not be attracting brilliant young European minds to come and start their businesses in London. So I think it is a, a battle at the moment between a, a vision of Britain that's older, is whiter, this is probably sounding a bit similar to some of our southern neighbours here, but as a vision that's older, it's whiter, uh, it's more culturally homogenous, ethnically homogenous, and a vision of Britain that, em that is embracing the, the changes of the world, embracing you know, the, the new industries, new, uh, new ways of doing things, and, and, and new people and new, new migrants as well. Okay, this, this is kind of wide open, but I want you to try and reduce the answer to Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, is history written by fact, or is history written by experience? Because history is rarely written at the moment, right? Um, written, well, you mean we're not writing it anymore? Um, no, 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 but in the moment. Oh, in the moment, yeah, right. sorry, of course. Yeah. So the further you get away from the moment, is it more, less about fact and more about experience? Yeah, lots of, lots of historians, I think, like, you know, in the 19th century, loads of people wrote histories of Britain that involved the end point of the story was this great magnificent empire. Uh, so uh, lots of people write history for, for themselves in, that, in, in the present, I think, don't they? But I think, I think that the best history should be based on trying to ascertain what happened. You go all the way back to the ancient Greeks, you've got Thucydides, you've got Herodotus. They wrote down these stories. They wrote down historia but because they wanted wisdom. It was called, it was like from the Greek root word, wisdom. And they just wanted to preserve the knowledge of the things that have happened to actually often um, save 
future generations the trouble of going through them themselves, right? So yes, listen, we're gonna have a, we had a massive war. It wasn't great. Didn't turn out that well. You guys might be interested in this because you can you can live the experience through my writing rather than going to all the trouble of having a gigantic internecine war in the in the Greek world uh, and learning it for yourself. Um, and so I think that sort of preserving those facts, preserving those, uh, preserving that kind of data is the po is the modern word. Um, is, is pretty important, and that's why the, the way to end it is, is very funny, because in Britain we had this big problem in the 90s. Everyone complained all the time. All kids were learning at school was about the rise of the far right, or the rise of the extremes, Bolshevism and nationalism in 1920s and 1930s Europe. And everyone's like, this is ridiculous. All kids are learning about is the rise of these fascists. And now everyone's like, okay, that was a good thing to teach. <laughs> that's good. I'm glad we taught that. So, um, yeah. Um. While the first person gets their question ready, and there are microphones in the room, so raise your hand if you're going to have a question. Straight out of it. Look at that. Uh, there's one over there. But uh, just before uh, we get to him, um, let me give a, a, a plug to Dan when I talk about the new wave of, uh, of historians, because Dan uh, relies a lot on digitization, um, his podcasts, uh, his uh, uh, video work uh, is available online, has a great following. Um, and one of the things you do differently than others, aside from bring your, your own kind of magic and presentation to it, is that you go to the, you go to the location on a yeah. lot of this stuff. Uh, you're not sitting in some studio in London. Um, one was just a couple of weeks ago, uh, you know, you, I watched you in uh, Culloden doing, a, oh, yeah. doing your little gimmick with, uh, you know, Twitter Live or Facebook Live, but the one you yeah. taught me last year. <laughs> um, and, uh, I mean, that's great. And it, it clearly is, well, it's, all, it's already, we're living in that future already. But how do you see that as a tool in the teaching of history uh, going forward. Well, that's so exciting, isn't it? It's so wonderful. Like, so when Notre Dame was burning last week, I got, I got on the phone. This is, that's a bad introduction. It wasn't wonderful that we're doing, but it's an exciting time in a way because Notre Dame was burning. The mainstream, uh, the, the news channels were interviewing tourists who were in, I don't know if you guys are watching, they were like, so what can you see? Well, I've actually gone home because it was getting late. <laughs> okay. So I got the Britain's best medieval architectural historian on the phone. And I did a podcast with him. He told me all about Notre Dame, why it's this astonishing building, why it matters, why it's the sort of ancestor of all the subsequent Gothic cathedrals. And, I, and then we put that out, and by evening, 100,000 people listened to it, you know, 25 minutes. And I thought, this is, if someone told me I was, when I was students like you guys, if someone told me I'd be lucky enough to do that 15, 20 years later, I would have cried, I would have wept with happiness. You know, what an amazing privilege it is to do that. And so the podcast is great. Um, I'm trying to build subscribers up for an actual TV channel like Netflix, where you actually bring you know, a community of people that want to pay a little bit, and then you can make high quality. So I think the internet is great, because it's allowing all these, we all know this, but like you guys, when it's, it, whether it's the Leafs or the Blue Jays, whatever, you can now go into so much more detail than, than we could get uh, 20 years ago, because you find these communities of insane fans. Um, and I'm just looking for my community of insane history fans. And, uh, and, and, that's, and that's, you know, that's been the, the real, it's been so rewarding to do that and to, to make high quality. And that also it's global, you know, the global reach. And yeah. you had this, remember there were people from New Zealand and yeah. everything, it was so no, exciting. It is, it's remarkable. All right, let's take a, a couple of questions from the floor of this gentleman over here. Um, hello, my name is Abdeli and um, like, I'm from York University. I'm sorry, my only question is that with the rise of Donald Trump and, uh, uh, um, and with Brexit at hand, uh, how can we teach young people or people who vote about history and the importance of history and not to repeat the same mistakes again? Because okay, you kept saying that okay, the reason that Brexit happened was people wanted to take their country back. Okay, same, okay, same with Donald Trump. So I was like, how do we teach them that their country was never theirs because immigrants came you know, in, uh, like America was like, predominantly made of immigrants, and so was like, Britain in, um, in the 1960s as the doors opened for other non-whiter immigrants like myself. So, um, so how do we teach people that vote or people whose voices are heard um, on the national stage about the importance of history and history from other perspectives? Because as you said, that uh, people who conquered wars, who won wars, told a different version of history than compared to those that didn't. Uh, so yeah. Well, no, that's a great, that's the fundamental question of our time, right? Is that how do we, how do we stop? 
there was a generation above us <clears throat> who knew that fighting gigantic trade wars, demonizing minorities, and invading people was going to end badly, right? Because they'd experienced that themselves. The, the great dream of historians is that you're able to, like I said about Thucydides, you're able to explain to young people, hey, if you do all these things, bad stuff, like give them a sense. That that's why people, you know, write my sister's making this wonderful documentary about the Holocaust at the moment, because these stories, it's, it's not good enough that when that generation die, we all just forget about the Holocaust. The whole point of history is we go to people who hopefully will never even experience anything like that, okay? But we are able to say to them, these are the dark places that humanity can, can go to if conditions are right you know, or wrong, okay? So we need, all need to be aware of that. And, we, and that's why uh, just using the language, for me, what's so depressing is the language of, of, this, of, of new nationalists, of the Steve Bannon generation, actually, whether Trump or other people in Europe, demonizing minorities. Everyone says, well, it's not too bad. They, they go, well, that's, but that's the beginning of something very dangerous. And if we learn one lesson from the 20th century is we, when the alarm bells need to go, let's, just do, let's, like, let's not wait until we're area bombing German cities, right? Let's, let's take action at the earlier stages of this. So when our political dialogue starts to get toxic, when our news media, when we get fake news, we get penetration of it. So the answer is, how do we do that? I don't know, but we've all just got to do what we can. And that involves, that involves going to people where they are, young people being on, it's being on, you know, on the social media apps. It's being on those platforms. Um, it's, it's producing short form content. You know, this wonderful uh, sharing short form content that's good. Building trust in, 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 uh, in, in good sources of news of, uh, and, and trying, to, trying to sort of, uh, and, and pioneer ways of kind of instant fact checking. There's some really interesting stuff going on with technology at the moment around, you know, you can get, uh, you can watch a clip of, of Donald Trump saying something and instant fact checking is appearing as they're doing so. So I think, we, I, but it's for your generation to pull everyone else out of the, uh, out of the because we're in, a, we're, in a, we're in a place at the moment, you know, this epidemic of fake news is a big problem. Sharing fake news, sorry. Yeah, I mean, trust is the big issue of the moment um, for both viewers and readers and listeners and for journalists. Um, you, you've got to believe what you're reading. And part of believing what you're reading is doing your own vetting of what you're reading. You know, I, I was talking to a group of students at the U of T a couple of weeks ago, and the, uh, you know, there were a hundred of them in the room, roughly, uh, post-grad students, so smart young people. Uh, and I asked them, I tried to find out what their primary source of news was. And without question, I mean, they're so lar far gone from TV and radio and the newspapers, it's all about what's on their phone, right? But then this, the next question is the key. What are you reading on your phone? Do you know what you're reading on your phone? Are you going to a trusted source of information? Or are you just sort of flipping through what you're getting on Facebook without any knowledge of where it came from? That's the great danger. In, 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 in informing and educating uh, the people. Um, and it's the great danger for journalism. They, they can get sideswiped through this. And in, to some degree, the elements of journalism have been, have been pushed aside. Uh, so, but part of the, you know, I always describe the, the, the kind of newsmaking scene as, uh, as a three-parter. There's, you know, journalists have got to promise you that they're going to dig for the information. They're going to go as far as they can in finding the information. Your public officials, whether they be elected or unelected in business or wherever, um, have, have got to promise to you that they, they are willing to provide information. But the key, it doesn't matter what those two do, if the public doesn't care, if they don't want information, or if they don't go to the trouble of ensuring what information they're reading is real, uh, then we've got a big problem. So I think you've, 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 you're focusing in on a, a, a very important element of, uh, of, of how the future historians will look at this period. Uh, were there any questions on the right here? Hi, I'm Jay Perry. I've lived through a lot of history. Um, I was wondering, I spent a lot of time in archives, and I am concerned with our world, which is focused on return on investment and branding. And I go into archives that I work with documents that literally are falling apart in my hands. That there seems to be a way to trans, a difficulty in translating the importance of historic preservation 
and uh, the ability for people to go to those original documents, original sites, all of that, and get it out there and help people to understand history is an important part of our who we are, and it deserves as much funding as any STEM course, or it deserves a name on a building as much as any law library or any of those other things. And they, it's just, at least here, I don't know about the UK, I'll be honest, and here it seems to be something, along with the many other humanities and liberal arts, that's just sort of ignored. Well, you're not going to find us disagreeing with that. No. Um, uh, and it's, but, but I think, well, there's an interesting thing in the UK, right? So we go, right, we've got a fake news epidemic, we've got a big problem, we've got fake news. We've also got a, people, a problem with young people feeling excluded from politics, not, uh, young people from different backgrounds feeling this is not... So they go, we need, some, we need to teach something, I don't know, civics or fake news education. And I'm like, imagine if there was already a subject that you could study on the most ancient subjects in the whole history of the world, which the whole point of that subject was to like, and use your critical faculties to work out whether something had happened or not or what was true. And, and in doing so, tune out lies and propaganda and try and get to the real sense of what had happened. And you had to use, and, you, and, and imagine if that was already taught widely in schools. And it is, we've got history. History is made for this time, and, and it's a vital tool. Study history, you'll be no one's fool. Are there any others? Um, oh. we're, we're sort of over time here, oh, so we'll short questions and, and Unlike short answers. Unlike the leaves tonight. Right. Just a little bit <laughs> sorted in. Go ahead. Question on leadership. Oh, here we go. So are we really in a bad spot with, for leaders in the world today? And how was it better in Churchill's time? I mean, <laughs> just, I, mean it's, I seem, seem to think we don't have very good leadership around the world. That's, that's a really interesting question. And I mean, we got to remember that like Anthony Eden, when he was Prime Minister of Britain, was full of amphetamines. Uh, you know, so uh, Napoleon, I mean, Hitler was, I mean, I'm not, he's not a great leader, but I mean, like, but in our past, it's kind of an unfashionable thing to do is to say, actually, you know what? The world's not that bad at the moment. We've got a major problem around climate change. Uh, we've got problems elsewhere. But like, actually, we're pretty lucky to be alive. In fact, we're incredibly lucky to be alive today. We've got a robot on Mars responding to controls on an iPad down on Earth, right? I mean, we're doing pretty well. We can take it. You can drink, not you, sir. You can drink too much. They'll take your liver out and put another one in, right? That's in England for free. You know, that's a, bit of a, little, bit of a wait, little bit of a waiting list. But like, that's a pretty extraordinary society to live in. So the answer is, uh, w w I think there are pressures on modern leadership around privacy, around you know you can't you know, your life gets destroyed. The financial rewards aren't very good because you know H Herbert Asquith, Prime Minister of Britain again, peak of Britain's back. He just like an American press baron bought him a house which he lived in. Very nice, right? So so now I think the, the, so maybe some of the best people um, aren't going into leadership positions anymore. But I do also think though we've also we are also tapping into a vast reservoir of people that never been on, that's women, right? So actually, some of the most positive stories around leadership in the world at the moment are coming from, from women who would have been excluded from all these positions even, well, even 20 years ago, let alone 100, 200 years ago. So I think it's a, I, I share your, I, I do, obviously, you look at the world and think, you know, how, how in 2019 are we living in a world dominated by Trump, Putin, you know, I mean, the, the, the new emperor in China and Erdogan in Turkey. I mean, this is Bolsonaro. In, this is not like this is not a. It feels bad, doesn't it? I agree. And yet, um, and yet, leaders have always been. I mean, I personally, I think there's a wonderful quote from the American civil rights movement, which is, you know, a, a strong people don't need a strong leader. And I think there's a big question mark around now, like, why do we have these leaders? I mean, like, w w you know, we don't really want a nuclear presidential monarchy in the U.S. Like, I don't actually. Uh, you know, I think we, we want leadership, but I think we don't need this kind of strange, strong man, medieval tradition. We've, we've still got a little bit of people. And in Britain at the moment, all the polls say Britain really wants a strong leader. I'm like, I'm not sure we do want a strong leader. I think we just want a bunch of experts working out what we need to do. Um, and I think, it, yeah, so that's, yeah, but, in, but an interesting question. Yeah, I, you know, I'm basically in alignment with that answer with, with, with one exception. And I think that we... Uh, we generally in the media are responsible for the fact that not as many people choose to enter public life because of the kind of scrutiny um, that Dan was talking about that they have to go through. Um, and they just so it's not worth it. You know, I don't have a perfect past. I may have done something wrong in school. Um, 
do I really want this all dragged out uh, through uh, an election campaign? I mean, you know, I have nothing but time for people, you know, like Bill Graham and the others in this room who have, who have served in public office, who've run for office. I mean, it's, in many ways when I look at it, it's a thankless job. You know, you, 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 you run for, first of all, the nomination of your party, and you've got to go into rooms like this in front of, you know, the party faithful and your friends and relatives, and you've got to basically declare everything that you've ever done and be prepared to answer questions about things you've done and what you stand for. So most of the people who are running for that nomination lose, right? They're gone, they're done already. If you win, you get to go to the next level and go through it all over again with another four or five candidates, a much tougher crowd, and you know, more insistent questions. And so you get through that, you win there. What have you got? You got likely leaving your home, leaving your family behind you while you go to the capital city to uh, serve an office. You've probably given up a job that's probably paying a lot more. You had great ideas when you were running for office. You suddenly find that you're just one in a caucus who will decide what you're actually really going to do and stand for. And you got people like me running down the hall chasing you, asking you questions you can't even answer. That's if you win, <laughs> all right? So I, I, you know, I've, uh, I've covered politics in this country since 1968, and uh, I, I saw some, some bad apples in that time. But the overwhelming majority are good, decent, honest people who are just trying to make life better for us based on what they think is right. But that's why they entered. They didn't enter to you know, get a bunch of money in an envelope. <laughs> you know, they, they did it because they actually believed that was the right thing to do. But, but it, is, it is odd to me, and it feels jarring, that we live in a world now where to become a child care, you have to, you have to, go, you have to do qualifications now. You know, nursing is not, compared to our grandfather's time, nursing is an astonishingly difficult career to get into with qualifications. And yet our politicians are still might as well be drawn from the Athenian Panix, you know. So I don't know. <laughs> so I, no, I, I don't know where that now. Maybe that's necessary because they should just be normal people, um, or whether we do start to go. Look, it's kind of unacceptable that you don't. You've never read the U.S. Constitution, and you're and you're. You know, so in Britain we had a, the guy in charge of delivering Brexit, and the big the big sticking point of Brexit, one of the many sticking points of Brexit, is we have a situation in Ireland where the, there is a. The EU has provided a situation where two sovereign bodies, Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland, can have frictionless trade and travel between them because we have regulatory alignment on either side. It's called the Good Friday Agreement. The guy negotiating, the guy trying to negotiate with Europe, had admitted he'd never read the Good Friday Agreement. Now, and you, you all work in offices and buildings where you'd just be fired. I mean, that's just a that's a gross dereliction. So it feels odd to me that we we haven't we've professionalised everything so remarkably, and yet our politics is spectacularly amateurish. <laughs> I'm sure we can all think of some fairly amateur <laughs> politicians um, not far from him. Do we have time for one more? Um, yes. Right there. Over here? Yeah. The conversation has kind of gone beyond this a bit, but I want to go back to the question Peter asked about um, the difference between experience and fact. And we have an expression that we in Canada have heard a lot recently, which is, I want to speak my truth. Oh, yeah. How do you, as a historian, <laughs> feel when someone speaks about their truth? Are there different truths? <laughs> well, that's a great question. And yeah. the answer is, of course, there are different truths. So make America great again sounds very different in, depending on the community and the socioeconomic group uh, in which you find yourself, right? Uh, and so that you can, yeah, you can have the same facts and different truths for sure. You know, some, some well, a weird example is, I, I, which I have been nearly murdered for saying. Some people enjoyed the First World War, got away from restrictive fact. They were 17, 18 years old. They got away from very narrow geographical economic circumstances. They were put in a big organization. They got promoted. They were good. They, they were lucky. They didn't you know, witness the terrible shell strike. They were lucky with where they were placed. Or, you know, and they came away going, that was a, that was a good experience. I enjoyed that. But they, and they were serving alongside men for whom the, that trauma would last them the rest of their lives. So, of course, you're right. You, know, you can go through the same 
situations and come away with different truths, I think. But we also need to be careful to say to people in an era of fake news and, and people, me, people sharing memes on the internet, one big meme on the internet at the moment that the white nationalists are really pushing hard is that actually there were more white slaves in colonial America than there were enslaved Africans because these people coming over, indentured laborers were coming over from Ireland, Scotland, England, stuff. But that's, you know, that's simply not true. It needs to be, and it's, being, it's a particular narrative that's being pushed. And, and that's, I think the, there are certain truths that we need to hold to, support, sustain, and, uh, and push back on. Good question, though. Good Especially, question. It's, been a, it's been a big part of debate here for the last couple of months, because there, there are different versions of the truth around one story, at least the, the, the proponents of different uh, parts of the story argue that now I'm going to tell my truth. He can tell his truth. She can tell her truth. It leaves you wondering what, what's truth? Yeah. You know, like how do you define truth in today's world? Anyway, uh, this has been great. I really uh, uh, and, and I know Dan echoes this. Thank you so much for your uh, your questions, your attention. Thank you. Thank you. To give the sponsor, sponsor uh, to our sponsor today, we'll be giving the thank you. Izzy Abrams, please come to the stage. Uh, thank you, Kent. Uh, as Canadians, we have a deep, rich, and proud history of having the news reported and history recounted. And nowhere is that better exemplified than our guest uh, speakers today, Peter Manfred and Dan Snow. So on behalf of the Empire Club and Waste Connections of Canada, thank you for the enlightening and entertaining dialogue we had today. Thank you. I want to take a moment to give a couple other thank yous as well. We have uh, some people who organized today. The, the, the tremendous amount of work went into this. Nancy uh, Herzig and Elizabeth Wilson, thank you so much. And also, thank you very much. And also, Gordon McIver uh, from the Empire Club, thank you for, for all the work you put into this. Uh, looking, looking ahead, we have a couple of events coming out. We have. Uh, Councillor Thompson, who will be speaking with Janet De Silva from the Toronto Board of Trade. He's uh, Toronto's Deputy Mayor and uh, responsible for economic development in the city. And we have a great conversation on May 16th, the lunch on May 16th. We have uh, an evening event uh, organized by Mike Van Solen, who will be our, the next president of the Empire Club. Uh, uh, he's a nominated president right now. And he will be, uh, he's organizing an event on May 22nd about uh, all the various ways people, the outside influences in politics are, are influencing the election. And then we have a sold out event on May 2nd uh, of Phil Verster from Metrolinx. So thank you very much for coming. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>